podcasting from a remote location somewhere deep in the heart of New York City. This is Crypto Characters, and I'm your host, Jason Nagy. Our guest for today is Mikhail Gurevich. He's the co-founder and head of Dominion Capital, which is a multi-strategy hedge fund that invests in a bunch of things, including blockchain. Mikhail, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I did a little bit of research before you and I sat down here, and I discovered something about you. You are one of three people. You are either the co-inventor of the MIG, who died in 1979, you're a 60-year-old chess master, or you're the head of Dominion Capital. So what I think we all want to know is, how do you look so good since you've been dead since 1979? Vodka preserves as well. There you go. Okay. So um, have, you ever, have you ever encountered a reference to the head of the, the co-founder of the MIG? Did you know that? that yeah, that's I had your a, f- name? a few people ask. It's, uh, it's some of the common name among sort of the, uh, I guess, the Jewish community. Um, we might be related through the you know, grapevine right. somehow, but um, never met them in person. That's a shame. That's a shame. Yeah. So, all right. Tell us a little bit about, about what you guys do at Dominion Capital. I, I know that you en- encompass a lot, but you have, you're, you're an engineer, right? Yeah, electrical engineering. So how does an electrical engineer found a multi-strategy hedge, come to found a multi-strategy hedge fund l- like you've done? What drew you as an engineer into the finance space? Because I find that to be a fairly unique match. I, I've, I've met a ton of hedge fund guys and they're finance guys, they're great at BS, they're not electrical engineers or any kind of engineers at all. So what kind of drew you there? So it's definitely not a, I guess, typical story, but then again, most people's stories are unique, right? Um, I had an opportunity to start a company when I was a sophomore, you know, back when, in, in back, in back in college at Boston University in uh, 2005. Right. And... Um, so I never got into Harvard, but I did get three Harvard professors to give me some money. <laughs> I think that's better. <laughs> arguably, yeah. It's uh, you know, a different experience. You'd, it'd be a lot harder for you to get into Harvard if you were Asian right now anyway. So, for, Yeah, well, for sure. And you know, I wasn't applying. Right. But basically what happened is, on one hand, you know, it was an incredible experience. We, we were in the first Y Combinator class in 2005. And, um, you know, at that point, it was very much an experiment. Why Combinator? Yeah, because... They're, they're huge now, right? Well, there. right, but, you know, every company starts with, you know, first step. And the first step for Y Combinator was the class of 2005. Um, you know, some of the other companies came out of there. Well, th- I think there's only one that's actually still around, and that's Reddit. Um, Reddit ev- came out of Y Combinator? The first class, yeah. Wow. Back in, back in the day. Look at that. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize they were around for that long. Yeah, well, the ri- original team switched up a bunch of times. They, mm-hmm. uh, I think they got sold to Condé Nast at some point. Condé Nast bought Reddit? For like something like $10 million back in, I don't remember, it was a while ago. That was a good deal, I would say, right? Um, yeah, well, nobody knows if they're really you know, profitable or not. Um, and it could be argued because, you know, a lot of times... You know, when these guys, when other companies buy companies and, you know, uh, private equity buy companies, right, it's easy to see kind of the brand value in some of these things, but a lot of, I think, the public that are not sort of sophisticated necessarily or not in, you know, capital markets and not looking at deals, they don't realize that some purchases come with liabilities, right? You have to invest more money sometimes in the business to, like, really see it through and get any value out of it. So, you know, I'm sure not only did they pay $10 million to buy it, but they probably had to put in some money to d- further develop it, right? Um, and I don't know how much of that capital actually went back to repay investors or anything. So I wasn't an investor there. All, you know, I just knew, you know, Alexis and uh, and Steve from the first class in, in Y Combinator. But, you know, back to your question, how I ended up in finance. So it was kind of a, uh, you know, a benef- not a benefit, but... Yeah, you know, I got lucky to be part of the class, but it was also sort of a curse because the problem is once you work for yourself, it's really hard going and working somewhere else. Not right. because necessarily their egos or whatever, it's just, you know, working for yourself gives you sort of the ultimate flexibility to decide your own fate, right? And like once you get a taste of that, it's very addictive because, 
you know, I love learning. I love doing new things, discovering, you know, learning from people like yourself. And, you know, many, so there's so many smart people out there. And, um, you know, that's just the best, I guess, aspect of running your own company because it's sort of you have the ultimate freedom to do, to make those decisions, right? Um, yeah, of course. So once you do that, it's kind of hard to go back and work somewhere else. So I started another company after, you know, we did uh, Y Combinator. Well, before you get there, I would, yeah. I would m make one fine point on that. It's hard to go back and work for someone else until you need the money. In yeah, which case, exactly. when you need the money, you can do it. You exactly. Know, you, you can do it. You can make your. We're, we're malleable as human beings. <laughs> Correct. There's, there's, there are limits, right? Not everything is black and white. So sometimes we're talking kind of ups, kind right. of. But uh, at the end of the day, the, the world is sort of gray. So to your point, um, started another company after I started the you know, YC company. That was more of a good learning experience. YC company. That was what it that was, was the first. That was the first one that I started. Um, you know, we made a little bit of money there. And then started another company after that. That was, you know, like I said, learning experience, and you know, that's uh, you know, basically substitute for saying that you know, we lost a bunch of investor money. But <laughs> I, I learned <laughs> things. You know, when you you weren't a hedge fund, so it's okay. You can well, that was that, that was back when I you know, used to be just an engineer. Um, gotcha. So did you say you were an electrical engineer, by the way? Yeah, but I, you know, I never actually applied those skills in the real world. It was always, um, you know, I'm a self-taught programmer. Sorry. Right. Oh, your phone's oh, buzzing. I thought right. I heard See, this weird noise. I thought it might have been me. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes you when you click down, it first goes to the buzzer and then it goes silent. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, apologize. <laughs> but for you know, uh, taught myself how to program. I think I was like, I think I want to say about eight or nine when I picked up coding, and that was by hacking. Um, I mean, I, I use that word very freely. I right. don't know if you remember MS DOS. Sure. From back in the day, so there was a there was a game that was called Mortal Kombat. I don't know yeah, if you remember, remember the original one, and the way you it's enable a great game. I, I I dropped so many quarters on that. Yeah, one. Yeah, so you could play on the arcade. And you can also there's a uh, PC co copy of it, right? You can load it up through MS DOS. It was a computer version, and okay. the way you enable the um, the cheat codes is once there's you know if you remember the command prompt, mm -hmm. you know you have to type in the name of the game like Mortal Kombat mm -hmm. Then you can append a number of cheat codes after you type in the command prompt. Um, execution file. Okay. Right, and that was my. I mean, th this is very elementary, like hack, right? But nonetheless, that sort of made me realize that not everything is the way, sort of, you know, it is as you initially perceive it, right? So, and I like opened up my mind to the fact that everything is malleable and we can change it. And that's interesting because I've learned two things just now. First of all, apparently I can hack things too because in Mike Tyson's Punch Out. You got cheat codes that you can use, and you would have to up, down, up, down, and all these different things, yeah. and then you would you exactly. skip things. So, but it never occurred to me that everything is valuable. It just occurred to me that I had right. a cheat code. Exactly. So well, everything is like you said. It's uh, you know, you're like a hacker, like basically. I'm gonna tell that to people now. Yeah. Well, cheat codes are clients. exactly. <laughs> I want to be careful though. Um. So yeah. So everything is malleable. You're saying. Correct. Right? And you know, to your point actually you know trying to make some money and getting paid um after i started those two tech companies I wanted to see kind of what it's like on the other side of the fence and you know being on the business side as opposed to the tech side went to get an mba halfway through the mba program got hooked up with a couple of guys from morgan stanley who ended up leaving the bank trouble you know, exactly so uh, well I, w I was interviewing at a bunch of investment banks mm -hmm. looking to become an investment banker because that's like the cool thing to do Right. And then I realized I don't want to be an investment banker. What year was that that you were? 2010. 2010. Well, 2010 was when I started the B-School, and then 2011 was when, when I was interviewing. And that's interesting because I'm a little, there's a slight age gap between yeah. us, and investment bankers were ruling the world, and it seemed like they were yeah. ruling the world, from my perspective, completely uninformed, right? Um, it seemed like they were ruling the world until 2008. And after 2008, you don't really hear much about investment bankers. They're still out there doing their thing, but so so it's interesting that that you wanted to be an investment banker after 2008. Well, I didn't say I want to be an investment banker. I said I wanted to see what it's like on the other side okay. of the fence, separating the kind of you know the financial markets and the technology. Fair point. Like talking about fintech, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. After a number of interviews, and 
investment banks typically have like 10 plus rounds, right? I had an opportunity to partner up with a couple of guys leaving Morgan Stanley to start Dominion Capital in 2011, focusing on basically trading what's called syndicate calendar, which is when you basically participate in the book building process with uh, investment banks on IPOs or you know any other kind of products that come to market. So initial mm-hmm. public offerings, secondary offerings. That's called the syndicate calendar? Yeah. Okay. Why do they call it's that a calendar? Because, well... I feel like a syndicate list would be more accurate. I guess the reason why, well, they, they syndicate the offerings, right? Like, for example, you, uh, sure. you know, Uber did the IPO a few weeks ago. They you know, syndicated between so many funds and so many investors. So that's the syndicate part in the calendars because there's a calendar of IPOs and <coughs> secondaries and all the products that are being pushed out into the market by the bankers. So it's a syndicate calendar. Okay. All right. We're n- n- not, not a very, man. yeah, it's not a very inventive bunch. I mean, it's <laughs> very kind of like, all right, to the right. point. Yeah. By the way, what yeah. do you think about, what, what it, is Uber's price up or down after the IPO? Well, initially it went down south really hard. Right. That's what I recall. Is it right. back up? Or? Uh, yeah. Today it was, it just eclipsed the IPO price back again. That's right. We were just talking about that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah. I guess if you bought in the IPO, you didn't get hurt too bad. Well, unless you sold when it came down, which right. is what most people did, I think. Right. Oh, really? Probably. If no, no one knows how that. No one does. Anyone really understand how how Uber really makes money? I um, heard that was part of an issue with the valuation before it IPO'd. No one knows how they make money, but I think a lot of people understand how they lose money, <laughs> and they lose about a billion dollars a quarter. Which you know is it sustainable? The question is really not how they lose or how they make. I think the question is, you know, can they reverse the trend and become profitable, right? So that was the case with Amazon for a number of years, if you remember. Everyone questioned, like, can they become profitable? Why are we paying crazy valuations yeah. you know, to buy the stock? It, was, it wasn't It was just Amazon. There was a whole bunch of those companies. Yeah. Well, Amazon was sort of at the forefront of that, right? Google was always, always good. Apple was always good. Yeah. But there were there was a whole bunch of question about valuations. Yeah. Amazon, was it Barnes & Noble's too, which is, doesn't exist anymore, right? Does it exist anymore? Uh, I think so. The Nook? But yeah. it's definitely not you know, uh, as big as it used to be. It's Amazon Light, but yeah. It, it was Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, and maybe one of these two other internet yeah. retailers, right? Well, you know, it's funny you said Google was always good because they weren't, right? They weren't really good until they've no. uh, put kind of AdSense and AdWords into play. They rule the world now. Well, now they do, but back when you know they IPO them for a few years thereafter, they uh, their model was basically like, listen, we'll you know we're going to concentrate on building this search engine. They're going to be the best search engine in the world, based yeah. You know, and they didn't really have a model to make money, but they said sort of, if we build it, they'll come, right? So a lot of people forget that in hindsight because yeah, now, you know, it's a printing machine for, for investors. It certainly is. But back when they started, it was not the case. Nobody knew how they were going to make money, right? So, and it was like that with Facebook too, right? Very similar. But, uh, you, know, n- you know, now you look at the Facebook stock, it's, you know, trading significantly higher when they IPO. So the, the question with Facebook was whether they can... I think the growth rate and you know a number of other kind of financial metrics, but uh, now when I think of Facebook, I just like I just imagine someone awkwardly drinking water in front of congr- in front of a bunch of congressmen who don't even know what the hell Facebook yeah, is. Yeah, it's um, you know the discrepancies in understanding technology kind of at the government levels are you know sometimes worse because these guys are the ones that are passing laws and rules and everything, and you know they need smart guys like you to advise them and re- kind of it and lead them where you know it's appropriate. Right. Right. Although I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw me in with the smart people to do that. But well, someone needs to. Very kind of you. Yeah. Um. So. But yeah, you know, talking about Uber, it's um, they're losing money. So I think the question there is, you know, can they become profitable like Amazon did when they said they wouldn't? You know, they kind of build themselves. I mean, actually, their model is pretty interesting because they're bu- they're building themselves as the delivery company, and we started talking about that earlier, right? You know, delivering people, delivering goods like Uber Eats and, you know, an interesting, if, if you follow that logic, right, an interesting field for them to get into would be delivering weed, cannabis products. That's right. Talking about legalizing marijuana. We're, we're going to call it weed. We're not going to call it cannabis. All right, right? We'll, we'll be cool. And I'll we'll call, call it weed. weed. You can call it cannabis because it's your, per, you're, you know, you, you, you're yeah. in the industry. I'm not. They won't let me anywhere near weed. Not just, not just my family. Yeah. But my, the people I work with, so. Okay. Listen, it's not for everyone. That's right. But um, you know, as a as a nation, I think we're moving towards that point. And you know, back to Uber real quick. 
I'm curious to see what they're going to do with that model because right now they're only really in two segments, right? You have food delivery and you have kind of, I guess, re well, people delivery, right? Right. Um, sort of individual, in individual capacity, right? They have you know, Uber pool, but can they get into kind of buses and whatever other transportation delivering goods, delivering you know, other stuff? Like, can, can you imagine? I mean, I just go back to when I was in college and kids would, not college, high school, and like kids would, you know, or maybe it was college, I don't remember kids would want to go get weed somewhere and you'd have to they'd have to call someone up and these dealers would have their own little black books and they would deliver to all these people you know all over the city and so you'd go and you'd meet with a dealer and there'd be some sort of weird handshake I, I saw this a couple of times I was in NYU so you'd get guys walking down the street going weed smoke you know and um, and now we're at the point where we may be able to open up our our cell phones and order weed to wherever we are, yeah, I mean it, that's a that is a completely different yes. world flip in. I'm trying to think, 20 years, incredible, like two decades, incredible. And you know what's? I think it's only starting because, you know, now I mean you can do that now, but maybe in the year. Well, actually in California you can, in a few other states there are delivery app, apps, right? For, you know, in California things only medicinal, but a couple other states you can order. Colorado, I think. Right? Um, yeah, there's a number of them. But what's going to be even cooler is that you know, I'm talking about self-driving technology, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to open up an app, you're going to order some some weed, and then you're going to have a self-driving car, probably Tesla, come by with a stash and right. just drop it off, <laughs> right, without anyone showing up at your door. So now so here's the question: If you're if you're driving Tesla and an autopilot, then can you smoke weed? You probably could, right? It'll reduce drunk driving if, if, their a if their application really works, right? Well, if you're the driver, then you can't, right? Because you still have to be paying attention. You have to overtake in case of emergency. But if you're a passenger and we get to the point where the laws, a lot f you know, because right now the restriction, I believe, is not actually on the technology because the, the cars come already with the technology that allows them to be fully self-driving. Right. There was a video of a guy in San Francisco who was f asleep at the yeah, wheel in that, a yeah, Tesla yeah. <laughs> driving. He was out. I, I saw. I saw all sorts of. I mean, you know, now there's. <laughs> it was. <laughs> so Elon Musk actually tweeted. Um, was it that the don't someone? Do this well, so, no, he tweeted out that apparently he, he, it was like very. You know, veiled remark to someone driving in the Tesla and they're having sex, <laughs> while it's <laughs> driving by itself, right? So it's like I don't remember what he said, but it was pretty funny. It's like I didn't know Teslas are used for that. And then you know some guy got behind in the in the back passenger seat to watch a movie and take a nap while letting his car. Like so, I heard all sorts of crazy right. stories. But the the problem is, it's not a problem. Well, right now the the situation is such is that the laws don't quite allow to have fully self driving cars. Right, right. You have to actually be able to have if your hand is off the wheel for a certain period of time, then it it like starts stops driving or something. Yeah, it'll ask right? you to jiggle the wheel like every thirty seconds or sixty seconds. Right. And there's yeah. some other technology out where that, that, uh, that looks at your eyes. I think GM has that. I was listening yeah, to Lex yeah, there's Friedman a, talk about it. There's a few s different ones. There, there are ones that you know they scan your eyes to make sure you're looking at the road. There's you know all sorts of other kind of awareness, you know, like little technology that are baked into the cars for for safety and whatnot. But right. you know, Tesla is so far ahead of everyone, just light years ahead, um, you know, technology based. So it'll be interesting to see. You know, I th I think. Do you think we're gonna? You think we're gonna have that? You think we're gonna have weed delivery? Sir? Uber's gonna do oh, yeah. weed. So, you know, thinking about it like philosophical terms a little bit. You know, what makes the United States the greatest country on the planet? And it's the laziness of people <laughs> that drives the innovation. It's true. You know what I mean? Uh, and like, what's ultimately the laziest thing to do? Right? Not talk to anyone. You know, just open up an app on your phone and eventually all of the stuff is going to be integrated into your eyeballs probably so like you're just going to be thinking about it it's like i want some weed and then tesla's going to show up in your door and that tom cruise movie you know comes back to haunt us. We, we're, we're seeing that happen in like very iterative steps right so like google didn't get to where they are in a day or any of the companies right how long were they not profitable for or was it i think a few, year, a few years uh, i don't remember like maybe half a decade something like that but the point is you know right now you go to google and you type in you know like I want a burger, right? And they'll give you all these locations. They'll tell you, you know, give you the rankings. They'll tell you, all right, there's a you know spot around the corner, you know, downstairs in the basement. It's you know, gives you the reviews, pictures, uh, like everything, right? And it didn't get there in the day. It got there over 20 years. It's but 20 years. You know, every day there was an incremental improvement. 
right? And right. I think that's what we're seeing with technologies and everything, just conglomerate kind of merging and agalgamating into you know what the lifestyle that we're experiencing right now, right? And that's only going to evolve, and it's probably going to evolve quicker as we go, because that's, that's really Moore's law, right? Yeah, something like that. That that just it sounds like nonsense to me, but. It also sounds true. Well, we're Mostly. experiencing it. I mean, look at this, right? Like self-driving cars, really just very recent phenomenon, right? Mm-hmm. Um, smartphones, 10 years ago, we didn't have that stuff. Yeah, I still have my first BlackBerry. I'm not going to, I'm going to hold on to it. So it'll be an antique, you know, for my, uh, for my kids when they're old enough to use a phone. Yeah, so now you imagine you know, 10 years ago, one's kind of, well, I guess a little more, right? 12 years ago, the iPhone came out. So imagine Did working. Did the iPhone really change? Was it the iPhone that changed the smartphones or was it the Samsung? You know, I've heard, I don't know if it's true or not. So the guys that developed Android, which was not mm-hmm. part of Google, right? Because Google bought them separately down the line. But the Android guys w- actually came out with the operating system before Apple, uh, right? right? Came out with iOS. Um, you know, nonetheless, that was the time when, I, you know, a number of things happened, right? Oh, by the way, the the touch screen that we use for the i for the iPad that was developed by Microsoft, like wow. a decade before Apple came out. With I didn't know that. And my wife worked for Microsoft for a long time, so they've had that they had that technology for a long time. They just yeah. didn't have the foresight to use it. Well, it's like the Romans in the steam engine. You know about that? Correct. Right? Correct. Tell tell us. Tell everyone. Well, it's and it's also similar to uh, ancient Egyptians, right? They didn't discover the wheel, right, or something like that. They yeah, couldn't. but no, but Rome had a steam engine. They just, they no, I don't know about that. Yeah, that, they used it. It was a toy. They used it for a, to make tops spin. Huh. But that was an, it was an actual steam engine. Wow. And it took 2,000 plus years for, for humans to take the concept of steam and turn it into a train. There you go. And then there was so. probably a number of other technologies like metalworking, right? Understanding, you know, dynam- the magnitude of pressure management. So... And that's what I was talking about earlier, right? You need to have a number of technologies in place to get to the point. So, like, even though the you know capacitive screen, you know, multi-touch screen technology was was around at the time, you know, microprocessors were not that powerful. You know, you had um, you know antennas were not developed to the point where you can actually integrate them, you know, into the electronics to the point where you can um, have all of that usable. So, oftentimes, you know, technologies like this require a number of things to kind of come together to have a working product. You know, right. I never thought about antennas as having to be have been developed, but you're right. I mean, I had an antenna on my house. It was the only way I could watch television. And then you got the cable, and then you just kind of forgot about it because that was the only thing you ever used an antenna yeah. for is on your TV or it was on the roof. Yeah. And that was it. But, yeah, these little phones, they have antennas in them, don't they? And remember, one of the big issues with... Mo- I don't I remember... Nev- I n- how did I never even think of that? See, you're an engineer. You think about that stuff. Well, eventually propagates to the public. Recall uh, one of the... I don't remember which iPhone it was, but one of them, um, there's like three or four, they had the antenna issue. Because if you have hold the phone in your hand, uh-huh. they put the antenna around the perimeter of the phone. And if you hold it, your hand Blocks it. basically bridges the gap between the, con- the antenna points. Oh, I remember that, right. And people would lose their reception when they started talking on the phone. <laughs> so it's like, all right. That was like, that was like five years ago, right? Yeah. Where that was the problem that was happening. Yeah, so, you know, combination of technology coming together, maybe using blockchain. You know, talking about the use of blockchain in cannabis space, right? Tracking the kind of the seed, uh, you know, the plants from kind of seed to sale, mm-hmm. right? Uh, as mandated by the state and the government authorities, you got to make sure everything is tracked, everything's accounted for. So you don't have guys on the side smoking dope? Exactly, because they didn't pay taxes. Right, <laughs> exactly. You can smoke weed as long as you pay taxes. Correct. And I have a theory that there's not going to be single, th- not a single state that has passed it, you know, the bills le- legal, you know, Illinois being the most recent one uh, a week ago will ever go back because think about how much money they're collecting from uh, from taxes. Well, you know, you know what I really worry about? What are all those poor drug dealers going to do? I mean, think about that. They, they just took away the revenue of an entire... Terrible. No one complains. All these jobs lost. But no one complains about no, that. But they, they complain about technology, right. but they don't complain about the poor drug dealers Terrible. that are getting put out of Terrible. business. Well, they can go become delivery boys or, you know, work the retail or work in the grow, whatever, right? right there are all true. these other jobs that are created that are paying taxes to the state. Right. Not only paying taxes at the retail level, you know, where the transaction happens, but think about 
you know, payroll taxes, everything else that goes into, you know, capital markets at work. Talking about, you know, billions, if not, you know, at this point, I don't know, trillions of dollars going into financing all these companies. Yeah. I mean, I, I would I would imagine it's a right. trillion. There's a couple of giant billion dollar marijuana, co- well, cannabis companies. Correct. Sorry, right? Correct. So I don't think we're turning back. And, you know, it's going to be just like alcohol. You, you know, legalize it, you tax it, you regulate it. Hopefully good things happen. That's right. That's right. You know, we all feel a little bit better. <laughs> That's true. So, so tell me about, tell me about how people are using blockchain with cannabis outside of using Bitcoin to buy. <laughs> to well, buy I haven't. Marijuana. I haven't actually seen it, but I think there are two good use cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is like I mentioned, if you can use blockchain to track seed to sale, right? Because if you know blockchain is you know, hack proof, all this other stuff, um, right? So once you write it to the database, it's going to be very difficult to to hack it and change it if you're you know trying to do something malicious so it's a very good way for the state to keep track of everything you know make sure everything is taxed and mm-hmm. accounted for properly so that's one good use case the other one is you know in the payment systems right now obviously since it's federally illegal it's very difficult for some of these guys to secure payment systems to pay you know people come in pay with a credit card it's mostly right. cash business which may, makes it dangerous and susceptible to robberies mm-hmm. and so on so one way to do it is to introduce a crypto payment plan, right? Or some kind of option to pay with crypto mm-hmm. when you go show up at a dispensary. Right. So you're not going through, you know, some of these kind of federally regulated institutions that are subject to federal laws. And obviously now it's, you know, a little bit unclear how they're going to be potentially um, fined. You know, if so Visa backed out, they're, you know, they're part of the network that actually did work with some of the kind of cannabis Visa back um, out of the cannabis. Yeah, business. There, there was a big, uh, big, um, I guess, news for the space a couple of weeks ago. So there are all these problems, right? And crypto can solve these because you bypass the, you know, that regulation. Right. No, that's true. In whether it's for the good or for the bad, but that's one solution. Right. Right. It's true. Although you would still have to, if you want to be really safe, you're still going to need armed guards for for um, for the cannabis business because then you're gonna. You're gonna have to cold storage the crypto, and you're people are gonna. It's somewhere, right? You know, mm-hmm. you're not gonna want to have that on on a, a, any hot storage, I would imagine. So, it's, it's, but you'll probably need, need less armed yeah. guards because I've spoken with some folks that work in the industry, and what they said is it's really hard to get. You can't bank the marijuana business at all. Like, there's you can't. Extremely bank difficult. Correct. So even. So everyone is having trouble with handling, handling the cash, and I've heard even landlords have issues with it. You know, yeah. like if you want to have a growing operation or you want to rent out a store, and you're going to be paying your landlord, and particularly if it's some sort of, I know you work with you, you've worked in some some syndications. If you've got a a big loan, you're not going to want that in like a, you probably don't want a growing operation in a CMBS loan, right? Because the proceeds are arguably could be illegal and I'm sure there's some sort of re- remic regulation that you're violating then, right? Yeah. The real estate mortgage what's the i f- something conduit. Real estate mortgage is it interest conduit or rem- I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. But the point is there's a lot of laws and regulations. Absolutely. And Absolutely. And crypto can solve that stuff. St- you still have security issues, physical security issues, but you have that in every business anyway, right? Yeah. Well, you know, a wallet is tiny, right? It can fit into your pocket. Yeah. But if you're, you know, a million dollars in tens and twenties, is going to be like the size of the stable, right? Right. So. It's a pallet of cash. Yeah. It's Mil- right. Millions of dollars in tens and twenties, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think crypto will be as good as cash eventually. You know what I mean? And I think... You know, it's a lot more usable to people that live in, you know, unstable regimes, right? So, you know, if you look at the United States, obviously the dollar is a very stable um, currency, and we enjoy the benefit of that. So to us, we don't see that sort of benefit. Um, But to people living in, you know, some kind of Latin American countries, you know, Venezuela, some African countries, um, right, they're currencies relative to Bitcoin, for example, you know, we're talking about when we had the crypto winter, um, even when Bitcoin fell 80%, their currencies fell so much more. So to them, they actually gained money or gained a certain level of PNL 
if they were um, if they bought Bitcoin with right. with their home currencies, right? So to them, it's a huge benefit. So, you know, obviously, kind of USA is number one. We're all talk- talking about uh, you know. So we should all we of that stuff. Should we start chanting? We don't really care or hear right US. about anyone else. <laughs> right. We only care about America. So, and as a result, we don't hear about what's going on and why, what are the use cases to so many other people in the world for Bitcoin. So, or other cryptocurrencies, for example. Now, you so you have a tech focus, right? And we'll talk about usable tech and all of that. Mm-hmm. But as someone who has who's a, who's a tech person, but also in the actually in the finance world in the investment world where do you see people what what are the different takes that people have of crypto how is it viewed by let's say the investor class the hedge fund manager class versus the tech folks versus other people you know it's a very broad spectrum I want to say of uh, of people with different uh, you know, feelings towards crypto I think it's almost like a standard, you know, bell curve distribution. You know, most people are, you know, fascinated by it. They want to be involved a little bit. They are curious where it's going to go. I think a lot of people understand why it's attractive. Um, you know, you have uh, a subset that are, you know, fanboys, and a lot of those guys. <laughs> it's a great they, word, fanboy. They give a bad name. We don't use fanboy enough in, uh, yeah. in the world. For a number of reasons. I mean, you know, a lot of them are very passionate about it, but right. there is also a lot of, you know, people that get too excited and get in, in trouble, <laughs> for the lack of a better word. Yeah, and you have guys on the, on the other side, like, uh, you know, Jamie Dimon, and a few other um, big established bankers, and, you know, not even established ones uh, that, you know, don't understand it. You know, a lot of people are afraid of new technology. They, you know, Laziness, a number of other factors where people, you know, some people hate it, right? But for the majority of people, I think er, people are curious about it, and you know, there's overall a positive sense. I think it's an it's a it's a technology for you know improvement of you know our lives and society. I think there's a lot of value add. You know, talking about net, you know, zero sum game in the mm-hmm. capital markets, but specifically in this scenario, I think there's huge value add to society. I would agree. I don't understand Jamie Dimon. And maybe it's a timeline issue, but I do recall when he said, I think he said it was, I don't know if it was Bitcoin or crypto, but he said it was something like garbage, right? He did not like it. And then they decided they were going to do JPM coin. And I just, I, I felt like there was only a couple of years in between that statement and the announcement of JPM coin. So I, yeah. I'm, con- but and it was, it was, it was only a couple of years. I, right? I think less than a year. Right. So I, I just was he that in the dark about it, or was the context no. different, or he I don't, just I don't doesn't know, so. he just knows nothing about it. No, I mean, I, th- I think I don't know him personally, but you know, to get to where he is, come on, you know, to get to where he is, you, you can't be, you know, a dumb person. I think, uh, you know, can be, you can be lucky to an extent, right? But to get to that person, you have to be very smart. I, I would imagine at least, or I would hope so. Right, so yeah, no, I, I, I certainly think he's. I, I'm not doubting his intelligence. Yeah, so for you know whatever reason, you know, and it could be as simple as, you know, a big part of the philosophy of Bitcoin is being is addressing the central banking issue, right? The fact right. that we can't trust central banks, we can't trust you know banking institutions. So inherently, it was in his sort of sort of self-preservation mode to say, as a representative of one of the biggest banks in the world to say, hey, you know, crypto is fluff and this and that, right? But um, on the other hand, when there's obviously clearly some kind of incentive to be on board the train, and when I think it gained a little more public awareness and appreciation, yeah, you know, it's easy to reverse kind of the story, but yeah, (laughs) if it's in his benefit, which it was, right? So... You know, can, do we want to say that yeah, you know, he flip flopped? I mean, you can look at it that way, or you can j- look at it also as that he maybe did some more research and kind of that's what happened. He well, became a believer. Like, who they, knows? Have, they have a Chase has a blockchain center for excellence, and they've had it yeah. for years. Oh yeah, they're pretty big uh, actual player in blockchain. Right. Which so, but when you put all that together, so you've had this blockchain center of excellence. It's not like it's just just came out it's been there for a while yeah and then you had the jpm coin announcement and 
in between t towards the tail end of that you start saying that it's fluff it's kind of like i just i think he just wasn't paying attention to it that's uh, that's what i that's what i guess because mm -hmm. i mean yeah i guess he could have changed his mind in a year yeah that's a pretty big change and you know that it's those guys were working that before they announced jpm coin you know they had that initial layer just down pat I mean, it, you don't make announcements like that without yeah. all of the underlying in agreement infrastructure in, a, in an organization like that having been vetted, and that takes a long time. That's my take. So yeah. My guess is he just really wasn't paying attention, and it was probably a reflexive statement without really looking into what his bank was planning going forward. But Yeah, probably. It's a pretty big mistake. Well, listen, he needed to defend his home turf, right? Because, like, we talked about before the you know crypto the idea behind crypto was to make banks sort of worthless right so the idea yeah they're uh, all you know not it, so i don't necessarily not. agree with it but you know that's a whole part of the kind of bitcoin philosophy and you know some some other cryptocurrencies that come with it oh yeah of course right. those guys with the bitcoin hats and the bitcoin guy and you know yeah with the lambos yeah <laughs> Lambos to the moon. Man. That's what I mean, you know, taking it a little bit too far. Like, I think there is a happy medium where, you know, we all can take advantage of the technology and its values, but at the same time play nice together. Right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on it. And isn't that always the way, the middle of the road, right? Exactly. With, you don't always get there, but the most successful people, the most successful strategies seem to be that yeah. way, right? Yeah. And, you know, talking about coming back and talking about multiple different technologies, being developed over a period of years to later be combined into one uh, service or product that's actually usable. So, you know, coming back to the phone app where you, you know, maybe, you know, 10 years from now is going to be plugged right into our kind of uh, you know, cortex and, you know, we'll think about, you know, getting some, ordering some burgers and some some weed. It'll just show up. And it'll just show up on the Tesla and, you know, but <laughs> it can't happen right like now. That. You like that Tesla. Uh, well, I just thought about it. it. I actually <laughs> never thought about it before, but, you know, it made me think maybe, you know, we should launch a startup or something but that's right um we can't do that right now because of well first laws and regulations they need to catch up right yeah. right now you can't have even though you can have the technology for self-driving cars and that exists as we as we know but some laws here in the country and in the state don't allow for that so we need the laws and regulations to get caught up we need uh you know obviously ai for the self-driving component of the you know, autopilot and kind of smart na navigation um, systems to get to to get trained and become better. We need to test all that stuff. Now I want to ask you something about AI. All right. Isn't it really just, isn't, that's an over, is it, is Tesla, what Tesla has, is that actually AI or is it just a whole bunch of, you, if it was blockchain, you call them a whole bunch of smart contracts, right? But it's a whole bunch of layered if then logic. I mean, that's really, so it's not really intelligence, right? On the most fundal level, fundamental level, that that is true. Yeah. Okay. Um, although, I mean, we call things apps now instead of yeah. programs, right? You know, you call the Bitcoin yeah. protocol. It's a program. These are all just programs, Correct. right? Yeah, you know, but to your point, it's um, from the way I understand that it works is based on, you know, statistical analysis and mm -hmm. prediction modeling where it, uh, you know, looks because the big. So there's the intelligence, the prediction modeling. Well, yeah, it's just based on statistics um, to an extent, right? I'm not going to pretend to know how exactly their models are written, but you know, just from kind of reading some public, um, uh, publicly accessible information, you know, that's how they're kind of predictive. Uh, that's how they're able to basically, you know, have the autopilot working, right? They right. predict kind of where the car is supposed to be based on kind of what the, the visual representation of what the cameras kind of feed into the system. Okay. Versus, you know, a lot of other guys would, uh, you know, li LIDAR used to be very popular and that's kind of, you know, you take a laser, Oh, it oh is, litter. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. the Li lidar, litter, whatever. whatever well, I've that's heard. Called. I've heard lidar. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you use that. That's a you know, it's a competing technology. That lidar, right? Correct. Um, and what? It, can you explain what that is? Yeah, the, I mean, the basic difference is uh, using lidar is you basically you scan sort of the road and you know areas around you, and then you reconstruct their image, and you know you kind of you infer the path from that, right? Versus statistical analysis is that you kind of, you predict where the path is supposed to be versus actually looking at everything. Because the problem with uh, with LiDAR is that in bad weather, it mm -hmm. doesn't work. 
because gotcha. there's no visibility, you can't see anything. But uh, you know, use the statistical approach. Even though you have parts sort of of the image, you can reconstruct the rest. So yeah, I'm it's not so a lot more with uh, with lidar, if that's yeah. the case. So that's it's like Daredevil doing all the driving for you. He's blind. Yeah. Well, in good weather, it's supposed to work uh, much better, right? Okay. But oh, it works better than the um, than the camera. I mean, at the end of the day, it's sort of binary, right? Either you're gonna crash or not. So like. <laughs> That's true, but there there are ways I'm yeah, sure where you yeah, can yeah, mitigate yeah, yeah. the likelihood of crashing, and that's probably a little bit better for for you. Exactly. So, but you know, that's another reason why I mentioned that Tesla is so far ahead of everyone else because of the technology, and they had you know an opportunity to work on it for for a number of years now. Right, and then they they get all that data, and they ju and it just writes up and grabs it. Yeah, that was actually one of the big um, I think benefits of when they got into a spat with uh, I think it was Mobileye, if you recall, a while ago, because they were their initial vendors of um of all of the software mm -hmm. on tesla cars you know v1 autopilot and it took tesla a couple of years for their v2 autopilot to catch up to where um mobile i was but okay. now they so far i think overtook where you know because of all of these improvements they developed in house and as a result of that they're much in much much better position right now so, so that was in hindsight a very actually beneficial thing that happened to them Tesla got rid of their vendor essentially. Yeah, back in you know, that was a while ago. You would, you would. Well, it's funny. You would think that Tesla always did it all in house, but I guess that's the whole point about technology, right? You can yeah. do a lot of outsourcing and yeah. find people that are that are good. Yeah. And is that have you done that in your when you you've had your tech ventures? Um, yeah, you know, listen, you build what you can in the house, you know, sorts sort of the rest. But you know, for Tesla, yeah, that was. I mean, I think the Roadster was actually. Um, built on like Lotus um, body, right? The actual car. So they did take a number of kind of over the shelf components from other cars. I mean, right. if you look at Tesla's right now, I think a lot of the components from Mercedes Benz, if you look at like, oh, really? you know, door switches and knobs and like, you know, turn signals, all like Mercedes Benz components, which makes a lot of sense. Cause you know, these guys, sh you know, they make so many of them. So your cost per unit is tiny. Why manufacture your own? Right. Yeah. When I would, you can, I would think so. But you know, critical stuff like, um, you know, obviously the software and all that, because like at the end of the day, I mean, Tesla is, you know, not only hardware, it's a software company, m probably even more so than the hardware company, right? And it's yeah. really the only car that actually gets better over time, which is incredible. Like we're not, right, putting like- What just do you mean? How does it get better over time? I'll give you an example. So yeah. I bought a uh, Model X about a year ago. Is that the sport car one? That's the SUV looking one. Oh, okay, yeah. I like those, they're big. Yeah, I'm not. I, you know, I'm not the cool. I have, I have a kid now. You know, I have, <laughs> right. I have a wife, so I need a new one. And um, you know, when initially when I bought them, the, the autopilot was was cool, but it was not like you know I can't you know I wouldn't be able to take certain turns and a few other things. Um, you know, and over a period of time, you know, it became much much better. Uh, you know, they just rolled out in a recent update. that was a couple of months ago, where now you, it can actually overtake other cars and take exits. Which oh, is incredible, nice. right? So if you're, you, is that a rush mode? It has beast mode. You go to rush mode. And so you're thinking like ludicrous mode, right? That's how oh, fast that, it goes. That's what it ludicrous. But it right. does have different settings. You can tell it how aggressively you want to switch lanes. So it has, uh, I think it was like low setting, has a uh, medium or modern setting. I don't remember. And it has a setting called Mad Max, <laughs> which is, you know, this uh, namesake it, it'll for a... Uh, you know, to be a little more aggressive. Right. That, you know, until someone gets into an accident and they see Tesla for yeah. having a Mad Max. Yeah. Right? Well, statistically speaking, Tesla drivers are a lot less likely to get into an accident if they use autopilot. Because, you know, like we spoke about earlier, it gives you, you know, instead of concentrating that just on, you know, slowing down, speeding up and braking and just looking at the car in front of you to make sure you don't crash into it. Now you have so much more time to look around you to become a better driver, become a lot more aware of your surroundings, look... You know, because what we're supposed to do, right, when you drive, you're supposed to look several car lengths in front of you to make right. sure what's going on down the road. You're not supposed to look at the people that... You're not that supposed to look at, you know, your phone and... Down the street, right. Yeah, play video games on, you know, whatever, watch movies. Right. On autopilot. <laughs> you're supposed to be looking ahead and kind of predicting what's going to happen, right? So used properly, it makes you a better driver, right? I don't know where we were heading with that. I Ma don't Mad know Max. We were heading anywhere. It was Mad Max, right? Mad Max. Yeah. Does, does your Tesla have ludicrous mode? Yeah. What of course. What does, it do? what does it do? I thought all, I thought only certain Teslas had that, like yeah. only certain models, like this the speed model or whatever. Uh, it just makes you go faster. You get a bigger battery, you go faster. Okay. Yeah. All right. That like a lot faster. It's pretty ludicrous. 
Okay. Like how fast? Uh, zero to six is like three. If you warm up the battery, it's like 3.2 seconds or something insane like that. I don't wow. Know. That's fast. It's very fast for a minivan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you know it's amazing they got a lot of other things right um, in the car. I'm not even, you know I'm not going to go into it. But uh, you know needless to say, uh, the autopilot is such a game changer. You know before I used to have road rage and you know being stuck in your traffic. Now it's kind of like you know sit back, you're a passenger of sort. Right. Enjoy the road, pay attention a little more. You know, it, but it's definitely more relaxing drive. That's amazing. You know what I mean? I'm not like driving around, you know, speed, you know, speeding and overtaking. You know, I'm just I'm a lot more relaxed. I'm paying attention obviously but it's a uh, it's a lot more enjoyable drive even than rush hour traffic which is incredible it's, th- it's like sitting in a cab in other words almost you don't care you're not except it's in your own car right exactly yeah well, that's pretty yeah. cool um so you know you mentioned initially that you started out in y combinators first class right that was after you graduated from boston university no we were i just finished my self- sophomore year at bu did you finish up at bu yeah, it was a little tough, uh, you know, trying to run a company and get an electrical engineering degree at the time, and also yeah. try to find time to sleep and party a little bit, right? Which is, uh, you know, very important of the. Uh, you only get a, you know, a holistic sort of curriculum. It's the most important part of college is the partying, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. I, I grew up at. Uh, I grew up. I, I was at NYU, and um, that was back when y- you could get forty ounces of Crazy Horse. All right, there so you go. That was a. Uh, those were some pretty wild times. Yeah. Crazy Horse is gone now, but... Um, we can still get a 40. Yeah, that's all right. I can't drink a 40. I, I can barely go. drink uh, a, yeah. a regular, you know, glass of beer as it So no, like, though. Edward 40 hands? That's right. <laughs> Edward 40 hands. <laughs> wow, you brought me back, Michaela. You really did. You're welcome. <laughs> Invented the MIG and brought me back to Edward 40 hands. There you go. Um, so so you, you're fairly involved. We were talking about you were fairly involved in... in in tech companies and you mentor some tech companies. Yeah. So what kind of usable tech are are you seeing coming up? And do you see any any of it crossing over eventually into blockchain? Mm-hmm. Um, we'll try to keep a little bit fintechy here. So, you know, in kind of classical venture capital, you know, startup uh, funding scenes, crypto, blockchain, startups haven't, I would say, propagated as much as they are sort of on the periphery, but you know, talking about the technology that makes you know our life easier and better, um, you know, th- there's definitely evolution in that. And you know, I'll give you a couple examples. One is um, you know talking about you know wearable devices and micro devices, right? Uh, with maturization What's technology. What's a micro device exactly? You know, just like tiny, tiny devices that you can either implant into your body or you know wear on yourself. That you, you can want. implant devices into your body now. Sure, I, I've seen you know sorts of ridiculous stuff. People embedding like magnets into their fingertips to like read magnetic fields to like oh, yeah. RFID. Well, talking about, you know, RFID chips into RFID. pads. What is that? Right? What is uh, radio frequency identification. It's like a little, oh, like, pads, like yeah. easy pass, right? You know, yeah. you, you have easy pass in the car, you pass the toll and, you know, you pay it to the government. So, you know, that's been around for a few years now. You, you know, chip your, your dog or your cat. So, you know, if they get lost, you know where it is, right? Right. I'm going to chip my kids. Honestly, that's probably the future. <laughs> Really? I would where not would be surprised. You, where would you chip? Where would you chip a person though? Like you gotta just right in the butt. Yeah, no, but I don't you know. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor, not a doctor but um, maybe the back of the neck, like the well, but it's close to the spine. You know, you got it's got to be a place uh, where you've got fatty deposits. Yeah, right? and you can't tell them, right? You can't make sure they don't. That's right. You tell them that, oh, we're taking a doctor. You're gonna get a shot, and then they don't know yeah. that they've got a microchip implanted in them. But that's been in, in movies, you know, James Bond, right, for a long time. Right. So now we can apply it to pets. You know, eventually maybe you can, you know, kids or you know, instead of an- wearing ankle b- bracelet, if you're, you know, if you got in trouble with the law, you be a watch, right? You know, oh, you watches. Clipped. Right, right, right. You, you know what clipped. I mean? Yeah. Um, but uh, so. So you were saying. Micro yeah, you know, devices, so a lot um, of technology companies. Right. You know, propagation of those technologies to a point where they're not like just theoretical implementations, but, you know, practical and usable. So one of the startups um, I saw recently, they've created this glove that um, line workers can use uh, at an assembly plant where they're, you know, doing like 10,000 repetitions a day. And uh, they don't know if they're developing arthritis or any other kind of medical conditions because of the repetitive tasks or even, you know, how far, you know, they're, you know, how far they 
they can use their hands. So, for example, they'll be wearing a glove that will tell them that, uh, you know, if they're, if they're doing, like, turning motions, how far should they turn their hand? Mm -hmm. Maybe they're overturning it, right? So they can actually predict and give you feedback on how you're doing those tasks to make sure you're doing them in a safe way, right? So if you're running a company where you have, like, you know, 20,000 employees, you know, working in factories, you know, just statistically speaking, you're going to have a number of people that are going to be doing the movements wrong or you know, doing it in a way that will you know, jeopardize their you know, health or whatever. So you can catch it before it even happens. Mm -hmm. So in modern technology, like materialization and all of that, you know, chips embedded into gloves to monitor all of that real time, connected to the mesh network to, you know, feed the sort of, you know, that data into the cloud where it'll get processed, you know, will give us instant feedback on sort of who is doing the work in, you know, the most efficient manner possible and doing it safely. The right, mesh so network, huh? So like sounds like the future, you like that, right? So I don't know if it's a mesh network, great. but you can certainly use that. Uh, speaking of mesh networks, that's how you heard about the latest um, satellite launch from uh, from SpaceX, where they There's released something recently. I don't remember what it was. So it's the Starlink program where they put a bunch of mo like mini satellites mm -hmm. into the payload and shot it up into the sky, and you know talking about you know having accessible internet everywhere in the world with um, micro satellites, huh? Yeah, so how I don't how know. How big are the micro satellites? I mean, I don't know, they're like a couple of feet across, and that's pretty cool. So they're using mesh network to basically communicate with each other. How do we get rid of the space junk, by the way? I mean, space is big. Probability that you know, eventually all the space junk will eventually descend and burn up in the atmosphere for the most oh, part. Thank God. It'll just take like 10, 20 thousand years. Oh, okay. Depending on the orbit. Right. Um, that's a good uh, question. When, when, I, when I think about mini satellites, it sounds great, and then I think about all the space junk, and apparently it takes some time to navigate it. Yeah. We should get a space junk cleaner like that guy, that the young Irish kid. Yeah. You know, where, you know what I'm talking about? No. He, so he was scuba diving, right? And he discovered, he realized that, the, that the, all of the junk, <coughs> the plastic, was float between the, in the first 15 feet. Mm -hmm. And so he invented a big boat sucker rubber that just goes and just comes over water and just picks up all the all the garbage it goes down 15 yeah. feet and it's cleaning up the oceans well he's operating on a like a 2d plane basically right here you're operating in 3d which is makes it makes it a lot more challenging not only that who's going to pay for that well yeah right okay so all Probably, right so yeah mi mini satellites right and and how how many did they launch I think they launched 60. 60 mini satellites? Yeah, 60 For, satellites. To what, what, what are they doing? So right now they are still spreading around. It's going to take them a few months to spread around to the point um, where they're covering, you know, where they're in place where they're supposed to be. And mm -hmm. I think they're going to launch a, f a few more hundred. Wow. I think they're supposed to have a few thousand. I don't remember the exact number, but um, to the point where they're all orbiting the Earth, talking to each other. And then we have uh, you know, global coverage of the internet. We've achieved the next milestone in our evolution as a species. Goodbye to 5G, right? Well, it's, it's a little bit different, right? So, but in a sense, it's similar where, you know, fi what's the difference between 4G and 5G? It's a, you know, 5G is shorter wavelength. So, for example, 4G will, will land. It's like similar to... Actually, I don't know the difference between any of that stuff. So, yeah. you, can you talk to that it's, at all? Yeah, so 5G, is, uh, it's a lot higher bandwidth. Okay. All right, so you, you can send a lot more data. But it, it works in, uh, on a shorter distance, basically. So it's the difference between FM and AM, right? Like AM is much longer. Uh, yeah. I hear 10, 10 winds on the AM, like when I'm yeah. in like Massachusetts, but I don't hear you. Kind know. of, very similar, at least you know from an analogy perspective. Where so AM stands for amplitude modulation, where you okay. basically send the signal and you modulate the you know the waveform basically in in its amplitude. So as a result, you can send the signal much much further. Right. Uh, FM stands for frequency modulation, which means that it's a s it's one amp amplitude, but you modulate h the frequency of the signal, okay. right? Which makes it basically so that I it's you can have mo significantly higher um, uh, sort of definition, okay. right? So, but or higher quality, for example, right? But it works on a much shorter distance. How the hell do you know that? <laughs> you know this it's the only thing I remembered from electrical engineering. Okay, well, all right. So you're. Oh, I was actually waiting for like 15 years to bust that out. <laughs> so, so all right. So then, 
3G, 4G, and 5G, what are the differences? Is it the same kind of difference or is it something yeah. else? Um, honestly, I haven't studied that much, but just from my understanding at a practical, you know, high level, that's th those are the differences that we discussed. So, you know, right now we're in the process, so Verizon is in the process of rolling out that network. Right. Right. Um, Huawei, I think I'm saying it right, the you know, Chinese company yeah. that got in trouble. They're in the process of rolling out, um, you know, their sort of servers and all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, U.S. is a little bit behind, I think, just because, you know, for, you know, government state, sort of government sponsored entities, it's a little bit easier to do that since they have, you know, s you know balance sheet over country be backing it. Right. Right. The, uh, you know, the IP laws and, you know, the protections that we enjoy here are a little bit more lax than in China. So they're not afraid to go in, and, you know, necessarily. Or don't exist at all in China. You know, they're they're not holding back to get, you know, uh, that's not to say it doesn't happen here. I think it happens a lot, very, very often, where companies mm -hmm. just, you know, copy certain kind of technology and just don't bother, um, you know. Paying the... Instead of, yeah, you know, and everyone's infringing to an extent, just a lot more blatant there, um, right? If it's, whether it's good or bad, you know, does it lead to accelerated implementation times? You know, yeah, but at what cost, right? So, right. yeah. You know, I think there's a, we, we have the laws sort of for a reason. I agree with you. And we live in the United States for a reason. No, we certainly do because it's the best country out there. Correct. There's no doubt about that. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, so where do you see, what do, do you see a strong connection? No, that's the wrong, that's the wrong way to phrase the question. Where do you see, are there any non-obvious places you see blockchain fitting in to the tech that you see emerging? Is it gonna be like what you call the mesh net? Is that gonna now be like one couple of giant blockchains that talk to each other, something else, or it's just too early to tell? Yeah, so last year everyone tried to put everything on blockchain, which, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. Necessarily. I put my uh, cat on blockchain last year. Well, how did that work out? But, you know, it, it, I had to cut it up really, really small, so. <laughs> exactly, so I think you know, the fact that we had such a major correction is good because, you know, f flushed out a lot of garbage. I think a lot of, you know, uh, pipe dreams, a lot of the fluff out of the system. And now we have, you know, companies that have kind of clear vision, they have realistic expectations where, where they're going or remain for, for the most part, right? They're still, right. you know, unsavory characters, but that's, it's going to be always the case, right? And, you know, people, you know, regulators and kind of established players, say that okay you know blockchain and cryptocurrency is used by you know the drug cartels and you know all of that kind of you know illegal activities but you know think about how m how much you know legal drug trade and terrorism the u.s dollar sponsored you know so you oh, can't I mean, like all of it right you know what i mean bitcoin it's is a small percentage right and then, you know it's just a tool just like a gun or you know a knife or anything like if it's good if it's used for the good i think there's definitely kind of up, you know, potential there but there's also potential for it to be used for the bad. And that's why we need, you know, solid regulatory framework in place that is not, that doesn't constrict, you know, what we can do and is efficient to use. Right. So I think that's uh, going to be the next big sort of, you know, part of the life cycle and development of the kind of blockchain and cryptocurrency ecosystem. Just getting the regulators on board and really understanding what can we do. Well, thankfully I'm seeing a lot of regulators actually getting on board oh which yeah. is good absolutely which is good well i heard you can start paying taxes on uh, you know with bitcoin in I ohio think it was like, yeah yeah exactly in ohio, you can do that exactly and they i think they hired bitwise yeah. i forget who they hired so i don't want to use the wrong name and then i i think someone said to me that afterwards <laughs> they might have been on this podcast actually that afterwards they found out that whatever whatever company was converting the crypto to to fiat wasn't licensed in their state to do that, <laughs> which I just think is so great. They've made an effort. That's right. You gotta exactly. give it to them. You know, that's good. And you know what's what I've always uh, just loved about the United States. So I grew up in Russia, right? Came here when I was twelve and a half. But what's amazing is like the checks and balances systems, right? So you have kind of states that are doing their own thing, separate from the government, and there's you know there's a lot of you know, conflicts, but also, you know, people working stuff out. And it's yeah. the autonomy of the states is, you know, gives a little pushback to the government to also make, 
you know, sometimes you know, right keeps the kind of the power in check. So, you know, it's and I think it's key. Well, it's incredible to see it in action, right? Talking about, yeah. you know, marijuana reform, talking about, you know, blockchain and crypto kind of implementations. The states are driving all, so of, all, all of the marijuana reform, right? Yeah. If, if nearly all the states have marijuana as being as being a non as being legal, how do you justify the federal government saying it's illegal? I mean, you know, it's it's it's, it's the, the will of the people exactly but yeah. and and that's and the other thing that i like about it i never really appreciated this stuff until i started um well up until recently i think and when i started seeing some of the real stupidity in the local governments when i left when i left new york city i live in a in a small in a small township and you know there's not the i don't see the smartest choices being made at times from a government perspective, but you also see that at the federal level too. And I like the fact that states, if if states have ethos, then you can actually go to a place that shares your ethos in certain things and have a respite from kind of like the potential of Big Brother, which is the federal side, to monitor you and that's clear now and in, in marijuana you're seeing some of th- some of that in crypto like hey man if you really love crypto you can go to wyoming and you can do whatever you want with crypto yeah you can take crypto and you can use it as wallpaper right yeah. over there i mean but um but in a, in a serious note they they're they're really supporting it over there so the states are doing important work that i i think i either never really understood or just took for granted for yeah. years well the other thing is uh the lobbying is a lot more prevalent prevalent at the federal level yes. to you know to your point you know if all of these states are on board what's what, why is you know federal government can't playing catch up and that's because of the uh, and i think it's pretty well known you know the lobbying from uh you know paper industry right um alcohol oh yeah, tobacco those guys, everyone hates those guys i know paper no one talk, but that's uh, you know pushing initially jerks. pushing right? jerks pushing paper well back in the day you know hemp was used for so many materials right sales rope did the, did, the, did, the, did the paper industry knock that out? Was that well? Uh, it's always a combination of things, right? Right. So they seem so harmless to me, you know, because everyone uses paper. No one even thinks about it. But yeah. you're, but but you're right. They they're cutting down forests and trees, and yeah. you know, and um, I never thought of them as, ha- as having like a lobby. I, I, you think of tobacco, alcohol yeah. as having lobbies, but not but not that. But you're right. Well, textiles uh, as a whole, really. Including paper, and they got rid of. Someone got rid of hemp. I remember when hemp was was regularly used. Hemp soap. Correct. What happened with that? Same thing as, you know, went by the wayside because of, you know, they lumped everything kind of into that schedule one. Mm-hmm. Anything that touches the plant, and you know, making distinctions between THC and CBD is, you know, it, it's very easy to say, oh, it's all the same shit. Right. What's the difference? Well, I know THC is what gets you high. It's in marijuana, Correct. but. What is so? How is CBD different? So CBD is not, and I'm not a doctor, right? Um, not You're just st- an engineer. I'm just you know, an engineer trying to survive. <laughs> uh, so c- CBD doesn't have that uh, like psychoreactive component to it, right? Um, but why? Is it like do science? You take, do you take the leaves from marijuana and grind yeah. it up like the way? Well, you there, make there are two oil strains, or? right? I think I'm using the right that word correctly. Um, there is kind of hemp that has very, very little sort of THC in it. Right. And then there is, you know, the other stuff. Marijuana. Exactly. Right. That has all the good stuff in it. Right. So The um, stuff that you want to smoke. Correct. Right. Okay, so CBD actually comes from hemp. Is that it? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Gotcha. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. And what, <laughs> talking about, you know, state, state and federal. So we had the farm bill that came, um, you know, came out and got passed and everything. And now CBD is right. uh well hemp is and by virtue cbd to an extent is illegal federally but it's still illegal in some states it's legal illegal federally. yeah yes federally legal illegal in some states so That's get so funny get with that program right so damn what states welcome have to usa i know right we don't know what the hell <sighs> no i don't remember but i do remember uh hearing we a story have a decentralized where regulatory authority right <laughs> yeah so like centralized government yeah, so some truckers got put, put I don't remember what state it was. It was in maybe Ohio or something, um, where they got pulled over with a bunch of hemp, but right. it was Ill- illegal at the state level, but federally legal. 
Right. Right. And then, you know, the trucker got thrown in jail. It's like, all right, <laughs> there you go. Poor guy. Terrible. Poor schmuck. Exactly. Shouldn't have been dealing drugs. That's right. All right. Okay. So we're, we're going we're gonna to wrap up, but I want to ask you two questions with the final wrap up. Um, the first is you've had a, a lot of different ventures. Um, and you've been in your current one. You've been at Dominion Capital for what eight years now. Yeah. All right. So that's that's a long time to be anywhere, particularly in this yeah. world. So you've seen a lot. You've seen ups and downs. You've seen mistakes. What is the biggest business lesson that you would like to put out there to young entrepreneurs, anyone starting up, or even old entrepreneurs? That's a good question. You know, it's uh, you know one of the most typical advices you get is kind of you got to do what you love and. You know, it's hard. It's hard to um, to get to the point. I was fortunate enough to be able to be in the right place in the right time. Um, but you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, it's all about perseverance. Um, you gotta. You know, Edison didn't get to his light bulb that worked on the first try. I think he went through like a thousand, right, oh, really? versions by the time he found a combination of components that all worked together in a way that produced consistent light, right. That's pretty so cool. Just I being think. able to make mistakes and grind it out until it works. You know? I love it. Don't give up, right? Exactly. Okay. And, uh, you know, no, no one said it's it's easy, right? Because if it was easy, everyone would be doing that. How many times have you failed? Fail every day. True. I mean, and and yes, that's true. But I mean, how many big failures have you had? I mean, if you know, if you're talking about like monetary, business wise, I'm not uh, talking you know, about you know. I don't know, it's probably a, a good 10 big ones, you know, where you lose a ton of money and you're like, all right, what lessons have we learned from that? And when, you know? so when, when, you, when you make a big mistake, you spend a lot of time analyzing it, trying to fade, like, wh yeah. what do you do with it? Do you, you know, take one, it apart? Or you, you yeah, move I mean, on? what do you do? So, you know, one thing I would have, so, you know, one, another thing that makes the United States great as a country is our ability is to conduct business, knowing that the regulatory framework is sound, Mm -hmm. when it comes to enforcing things, when you have a contract with someone, right? Right. And that's good. Unless uh, you're litigating in New York, which I don't recommend because I don't know sometimes about what those judges do, but anyway. Well, hold on, you're lawyers. Yeah, I know that. I'll get off my horse, my annoyed horse. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I have to say one thing that I've learned and, uh, you know, you kind of make a mistake once, you know, shame on, uh, what did George Bush say? Shame on you. Exactly. I'm going to mess it up. Fool me twice? Yeah, so that's saying. Can't, can't get fooled again. Can't get fooled again. <laughs> that's right. But, um, you know, when you're putting together documents on any deal, right, whatever you put in there will only take you that far. And at the end of the day, you're dealing with people. And, you know, it's very important to have good relationships with people that you're working with. Um, and because, like I said, legal documents will only take you to the to a point. Um, and the most important thing, having you know, tr being able to trust your partners, to be able to trust the people that you work with. Um, you know, whether you're finding companies or you're entering into partnerships. Um, in other words, you know, if you're putting together, you know, a deal or w whatever it is that entails legal w paperwork, don't you can't trust that a hundred percent, right? You, you got to be able to trust the people. And I would much rather work with someone that obviously I trust and we necessarily don't have, you know, a thousand pages of legal paperwork on a deal versus, you know, putting together a contract that's, you know, a thousand pages, but, you know, it's questionable whether you can trust someone on the other side. So, you know, trust and kind of having a good relationship with people is, is very, very, I think, important to a successful business. Right on. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you kind of a boring question, but I'm, I'm really curious to know the answer. What books are you reading right now? What books I'm reading? Um, so I just picked up, uh, actually a friend of mine recommended, Rajiv, if you're listening to it, um, thank you. Uh, so. We'll make sure he listens to it, okay? Exactly. Um, it was about um, KKR, kind of how they came to um, where they were. I don't remember okay. the name of the book, um, but it you know, it's just one out there. Gotcha. It's about kind of the story how they came. I've heard I've heard people talk about that. Yeah, book. yeah, that's yeah. um, anyway. That, that that was an interesting one. Um, there is uh, I don't know if you saw the the recent. So I kind of I feel like everyone stopped watching HBO after Game of Thrones ended. But there's <laughs> is it actually fully done. 
Yeah, apparently. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, I think they're trying to come up with a sequel or something, but who, who, I don't know if anyone's going to watch that You know, uh, I can't, uh, after the, the finale. South Park ruined it for me. I can't ever watch it. <sighs> South Park was did, the did, best. Did you see what they did to Game of Thrones? W- is that a recent one? No, it was really when it started. So, I, it, you know, I'd never seen it, and um, they were complaining about all the wieners on it. And so they go to this we- the guy's house, and they got someone that looks like him, and then he gets a... You know, he gets a whole choir of guys that just sing wiener, wiener, wiener. No, I didn't and, see that. And episode. so you could, you could, if you do, if you YouTube it, you'll find it, and you'll find like that one little clip. It's like a minute long clip, and I've, I've, it's literally, it literally, I could, I said, I can't ever watch Game of Thrones now because it's yeah. been completely ruined by South Park. So, South Park, you know, they, I have to give them that that show has been. I've been watching it since I was twelve, and yeah. it's been such a relevant show for for so long yeah it's amazing it's, inc- it's incredible how many little things they get right and you know just the perfect level of sarcasm but you know back to the books right um, promise me you'll watch that youtube clip okay for sure okay. I, l- I love south park um so books yeah talking about hbo um they had a very good uh, mini series on chernobyl i heard about that so one. so yeah. that one i just finished i just watched the whole thing like two days really yeah, um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, you know, they have wolves there now. It's they have been abandoned wolves. for so long. The wolves and all the animals came back. It's yeah. wild. Yeah, well, it's in the truest sense of the word. So uh, there's, n- there's a podcast that comes with... So they did a podcast that comes with sort of the show to go into more details of that. So, mm-hmm. then, yeah, I just picked it up. It was cool. But, um, you know, I guess it's not a book, but, you know, now you have, you know, Audible is so good. Oh, yeah. You know, who has time to read? I know. Right? Um, you can learn while you walk. Exactly. Um, but, you know, another book that I usually reread every year is called 48 Laws of Power. Oh, really? You like that book? Have you ever read it? I started on it, and um, it was I, I, it w- I stopped reading it when they talk about when they got into, who was the lover guy? What's his name? Casanova. Casanova. Yeah, was, yeah. was that in 48 Laws of Power? Yeah, yeah, there's a few in there. Yeah, so I found parts of it to just be too Machiavellian, and I just didn't know if it. So, so you got to take it with a grain of salt, just like everything else, right? I think right. he tried. You know, he kind of put like four different books into one, right? Yeah, you know, The Prince and Sun Tzu's Out of War, and like a few others um, into this like amalgamation, basically. But um, so you like that one? I think on a philosophical level, it makes you think about what it means to be human, and like, you know, it, you know, just having sort of the knowledge to manipulate other people mm-hmm. to an extent is kind of like a really you know dark thing right like why yeah. as humans do we need that that's just uh, you know but it's necessary sometimes so like does that make us better does that make us who knows bad people or or if you you know just like any other tool if you use it for the good is it a good thing right it's it makes true. you do you f- did you find that like the 48 laws of power to be accurate like that that what he's saying there is actually effective you know, there's a couple of ways you can use it. Why you can use it, you know, to influence decisions for other people and you know, in business settings and so on and so forth. But you know, I use it more for you know to really understand and try to kind of self discovery, right? right? And like observe yourself in certain actions and like how do you respond to certain things? And like using those 48 laws of power, just you know, become a better person. Right. So. Oh, and what else? What else? Is that um, it? That's that's a lot. That's plenty, but. Yeah, there's a, you know a few things here and there. I'll tell you next time. All right. Okay, cool. Well, Mikhail, thank you for yeah. coming. Appreciate Thanks. you having us. Thanks over. for having us. Or and um, we'd love to have you sometime again soon, okay? Thank you. All right.